Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. In today's lecture Dr. David Fenio will talk about association and market selection. Market selection helps to model an easy interpretation taking few features into account. Most of the protein candidates may not directly related to the phenotype. So, marker associated selection or mass help us to feature those candidates and build a good predictive model. Dr. Fanio will also discuss about how many features need to be considered for building reliable model and why multiple features makes a model complex. What is the optimal number of features? He will briefly discuss different kinds of methods which are available which could help in the feature selection. He will also highlight what is data snooping. So, let us welcome Dr. David Fenio for his last lecture. The other thing is marker selection that we already mentioned earlier. Uh, so, now we do all these measurements and uh, uh, we, you, we know that most of the proteins or most of the transcripts are not going to be uh, related to our phenotype. Uh, so we really, it would be much better to just have uh, build the model using the ones that uh, we, uh, uh, we know are related. But of course we do not know uh, which ones to start with. So we need to, so the, uh, if we look at marks, so why do we do marker selection? So the, uh, having few features, um, it makes the model easier to interpret. Um, so, so one thing that we have talked about building these predictive models um, and we want to predict something, but if we can also understand, that's uh, of course a much better uh, thing. And often when we build very complex models, we don't uh, understand and maybe won't have a chance to understand. Um, few features, so it's easier to interpret. We can start thinking about biological function. Uh, they're also less likely to overfit because fewer parameters. Uh, but usually we get a little bit lower prediction ac accuracy. So, so that's something to balance. Uh, and that's what we use to the, then decide how many features. So uh, as opposed to if you have many features, it's difficult to interpret. We don't know what's going on. And uh, uh, then of course more likely to overfit because we do have an enormous amount of parameters. Uh, but of course as we add in more and more uh, things we get uh, higher prediction accuracy, but it, it, we're not sure whether that's really real. Um, so uh, there are a few different ways to do this. Um, one uh, set of methods are called filtering methods. So in these we, uh, we look at what is the predictive power of each protein. And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, and then we select the ones with the highest uh, uh, predictive power. Um, and so we look for which proteins are, have high correlation with uh, the target variables so or whatever we, um, let's say, uh, tumor subtype. Um, we also don't want a lot of uh, predictors that are correlated with each other. Uh, we want them to be somewhat uh, uncorrelated um, and uh, also we want them to have lots um, of information and that's pretty much the same as uh, high correlation with the target value. So but this is now we look at evaluate each individually. Um, now the other class is these wrapper methods where we uh, look at the predictive value uh, uh, power uh, jointly. And so the, the idea is that uh, it's, they're not independent of each other, so uh, probably uh, the, um, we will get a better uh, result using the, where we evaluate them uh, jointly. So uh, 
there are two ways. So one is that we start with, the, uh, let's say, the one that has most information, then we add the second one, we evaluate them together, and then uh, was there, we, we, uh, what we mean by evaluating is we check, is there any additional uh, point of adding the second one? Um, does it improve our results? And then we continue adding, adding until it's not, uh, uh, the, the results don't uh, improve anymore. And of course, this, again, we have to do this within cross-validation because otherwise uh, it will overfit. Um, then the, that was forward selection. Backward selection is that we uh, remove instead. And then we can also, there are uh, people have um, combined this. So one very popular way of doing this is called uh, recursive feature uh, extraction, uh, which is probably the most widely used one. Um, so uh, one, some methods like lasso. So lasso was when uh, we regularized uh, adding in the uh, absolute value of the uh, uh, parameter vector uh, times a constant. There we actually get explicitly feature extraction and uh, some variables will, uh, will fall out, uh, will be, I mean some parameters will become zero. So uh, then with marker selection, so the question is what's the optimal number uh, uh, of features? So uh, that's, uh, uh, usually we want two things. We want it to be as simple as possible so we can interpret it, and, uh, but we want to get good predictions still. So uh, if you, one thing that people talk about is the curse of dimensionality, which we definitely have always, is that we have, we measure few samples, even, uh, I mean, within CPTEC, we measure 100 samples. That's still quite few. Um, but for each sample, we measure uh, tens of thousands of, uh, uh, I mean, 10,000 proteins, maybe 30,000 transcripts, and so uh, another 30,000 phosphorylation sites. So uh, we have much more measurements on uh, each uh, variable than we have uh, samples. And this makes uh, things very uh, hard, first of all, not to overfit, um, but also often uh, when we find signatures, they are not unique, but we have a large, uh, we could, there are many uh, signatures that are equally, uh, uh, would make equally good predictive models. Okay, so now finally, <coughs> uh, cross-validation, so we have all these hyperparameters that we need to decide on, uh, but what we say we do have our data set that we divide into train and test, um, but uh, we need to decide on these uh, variables and we're not allowed to use the test set to decide on the hyperparameters. So what we do is we uh, further divide the training set, but we divide it many times. So here we have taken uh, uh, the blue region of the training set as the, the train that we actually do the training, and then we use this yellow as validation. Uh, for validation, meaning that we um, define, for example, the learning rate, uh, the uh, regularization rate, and so on. And then we do this uh, many times for different subsets. So, for example, five-fold cross-validation or ten-fold cross-validation are uh, commonly used. Um, and we can even, since we do have uh, limited data sets, um, we, we often also do uh, 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 that we do another, they don't do this division of training and test, but do uh, what's called nested cross-validation. So we do a cross-validation down here, but then we do a similar cross-validation uh, up here on top of it. Um, so that's, uh, um, and, and this is very uh, important to, to do uh, uh, well. But a, a lot of the software packages do have this built in. Okay, so another few things I wanted to just mention. Uh, I will only take a few more minutes. Um, so one is sampling bias. 
so uh, that's so we really the the machine learning method will only give us uh, what we train it for. Um, so this is a classical example um, of in the this election, the uh, Truman won, uh, but uh, the polls, uh, the uh, the polling uh, companies, uh, the way they did the polls is that they called people on their home phone. Um, and I forget, this was in the late 40s, so um, uh, only rich people had phones. Uh, so, and they uh, uh, preferably, uh, mo mostly voted Republican, and uh, so the uh, polls got it completely wrong. So here is a newspaper that actually printed it in advance because they were so sure that uh, Truman would lose. And this is something that happens to us uh, a lot in uh, biomarker discovery, and so this uh, you'll have the, the slides. Uh, so uh, it's definitely worth reading. So uh, David Ransov has written several papers on uh, on this problem, and here this is just some uh, uh, list of what can go wrong. But it's definitely one should spend quite a lot of time thinking about what. Uh, um, for example, if one would develop uh, uh, a, uh, a blood test for early discovery, um, one shouldn't collect the, uh, the normal samples in a different clinic than uh, uh, for the, the samples from people with, uh, uh, that have cancer. It should be, uh, but there, so there's a lot of, it's worth reading these and a lot of things to think about. Um, okay, so uh, then, uh, the again, I've said this several times. So uh, the test set data has to be independent. Otherwise, it's not. If you train, uh, if you test your uh, model on something you've trained with, it's really uh, not going to uh, tell you how good the model is. So we talked about a little bit about mo when we have very complex models, it's difficult to know when, uh, uh, if the model uh, uh, tells us something about reality. So one thing, especially with images, it's easy to, so here we have a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, an image, and uh, I think the predict, uh, the, uh, the neural network in this case was able to say uh, that it, uh, this was, it found that it, uh, there's an electrical guitar, it thought, from this, uh, acoustic guitar from that, and Labrador from that. So that sounds pretty reasonable. Um, but often we, we can have this case, where this was classified as a wolf, but what was used for classification was the background snow. Um, and this, uh, this can easily happen in proteogenomics. Um, that uh, we, since we have so much, we, we, if we build a very complex model, we can get something that's irrelevant. What happened probably was in, this, in, in the training set, all the wolves had snow in the background. And uh, that's uh, um, something that can happen. So another thing that uh, is still uh, with image analysis with all its success. Here we have an original image, three images, that were classified like you would uh, uh, see it. But then if you add a little bit of perturbation, that's barely, you can barely see any difference. Then all these three images are classified as ostriches. Um, and so, so there is a lot, then we, especially with complex deep learning methods, there are lot of things that we don't understand. And it's actually even worse, these are quite complex images, but uh, even for simple handwritten digits, so these are uh, classified correctly. So this is the handwritten image and below is the, what the, the neural network says. But again, if we add a little bit of noise, you see that it barely, uh, definitely doesn't disturb us. 
we can still see clearly what it is. And then, for example, this 9 here becomes, a, according to the network, becomes a 3. And this is now um, people that developed this network classification knew about this problem and tried to fix it. But uh, didn't uh, uh, succeed. And even worse, these are all classified as zero, even though there is nothing there. Um, so, a um, few books. Uh, these are very easily accessible books, I would say. Uh, an introduction to statistical learning, uh, more applied predictive modeling. Um, both of them teaches you, uh, gives you a good uh, starting point for uh, starting to do predictive modeling uh, and uh, feature extraction. Um, the other thing I recommend, and then we're going to start that during a hands-on session, um, you really know, need to learn how to program. Uh, there's no way around it. Um, so uh, this is a good starting point. Our is uh, prob since you now have all have R Studio installed, um, you should go home and uh, continue using it. And uh, this, uh, uh, there is a PDF available of this book online. So uh, um, I think all of these books are uh, available uh, as PDFs online also. So I hope that you've learned a little bit about how to train uh, predictive models and then how to test them to avoid overfitting. Hi, David. Uh, I have a more general question. So, you gave us an example of this 1940s uh, presidential election through Universal. So, uh, we have come a long way, right? 2018. But we still seem to be getting this thing wrong time and time again. Yes, 2016 so, was another yeah, example. That was a good example. And uh, right now, I'm going at its, uh, its election season in India. So, I'm sure we'll get it wrong, or many of the uh, outlets will get it wrong. So, what's your uh, take on that? Why are we getting this, you know, so wrong? Uh, I mean, that, I'm not, um, don't know that much about predicting elections, but uh, um, in general, in, let's say, biomarker discovery, or, um, I mean, we get it wrong for, uh, one thing is that we don't think about it, maybe, uh, well enough. Um, and we take shortcuts. Uh, that's, and, but it's also very difficult to do it right. That's uh, the main thing, I think. Yeah, and also, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's not easy to collect enough samples, so we have to uh, do them over many hospitals, and it's, it gets very complicated. And it's actually, it is not easy to think it through. So you mentioned that uh, the normal uh, issues in cancer situation, the normal issues will not be collected from a hospital which is remote from the ones where the cancer issues are collected. So one is there could be ethical issues here. Like if you want to collect it from the same hospital, there could be ethical issues. And the other is such a scenario is generally not uh, seen I mean, uh, Mani talked about some solution like trying to do batch correction and things like that, but again, it's, as I said, better to avoid that if possible. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so one should definitely try to have uh, that, uh, let's say, normal patient cancer patients um, are, I mean, but, for example, for, for blood testing, one could imagine that there is a clinic where people come and uh, uh, when they come there, they don't even know if they have cancer, the doctors don't know. So that's a good situation that uh, uh, during the testing, no one knows and uh, uh, they are treated the same way. And only after uh, 
the samples are taken and have been tested, if that's, if one can do that, that's the ideal situation, I think. But usually, I mean, often we do have to make compromises, but we should try to make as few compromises as possible. So, two comments to make. The, the political thing that you, uh, you brought up is, is a lot more complicated because human psychology and uh, how people behave is involved. I think the example David Day was for showing bias, but the one you brought up about the 2016 election is a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. So, who goes to elect, who goes to vote? is also part of the prediction and so the polling does not take that into account in a proper way. So, it, it, I, I hate Hillary Clinton, so I get all my friends to come and vote for Trump. So, that dynamic is not taken into account when the polling is done. So, I think that that's a much more complex example that it, uh, involves human behavior and psychology. So, I think that's off the charts for this course. <laughs> the other comment I wanted to make was, David brought up uh, feature selection and he also talked about keeping your test data set separate and using cross-validation. So one of the common mistakes that people make and one of the mistakes I made too early on is to use your entire data set to do feature selection and then split your training mm -hmm. test set. Yes. So that is a very bad... So again, if you are working in the business world and you have millions of data points, I think it doesn't make that big of a difference. But in biology, where you have only 100 or 50 samples, if you do that, then you already have your answers in your features. And so you will do very well on your test set, but the next set of new samples that come from the hospital, you will fail back. So I, I used to work previously in the telephone industry, where you get hundreds of thousands of samples or records. But when I moved to working on biological samples, uh, you, you really have to pay attention to not contaminating your uh, training and test set and keep them separate from the team. My question is that, uh, see, I developed a kernel or train my uh, kernel on set of features selected from a lot of other features and selected from other features from which my model is already developed. Now, when I go for testing, the test data set somehow misses one feature, that feature is in it that could not be collected from the population sample at all. In such scenario, what is the way of again to go back and develop the problem with one less feature? Or can I have a way of to manage the same yeah. train model? So, so, so some uh, machine learning methods are better at handling uh, missing data like that. Uh, so, especially uh, some of the tree-based methods, uh, there uh, you can uh, set them up so that they can, even if you uh, have in your training set the feature and then in the test set, uh, not, it can still work well. Like random, random for it? So, when in tree-based methods, like David mentioned, especially the random forest, when you build your model, you can turn on uh, uh, storing surrogate features, and so when your main feature is missing, you will use your surrogate feature instead of that. And so if you have like five surrogates for each uh, main feature, then if one or two of your main features are missing, you will use the surrogates. So obviously there will be some degradation in the model because if the surrogate was as good or better than the main feature, that would have been the main feature. So you will do some performance, but you can still do your uh, prediction. Is it the same thing that in interpolation and uh, Fixing some more data points. No, that is missing value imputation. That is different. I spoke about it uh, 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 before yesterday, but that's a, that's another thing you can do. Uh, but I think using surrogates is a more robust way of dealing with it because when you impute, so when you impute, it's one thing to look at all your data and impute, but when you have test data, which is just a few samples. How do you impute? Do you use only the test data to impute or do you use your entire training data and test data to impute? So I wouldn't recommend combining everything to impute because then you're kind of making your test data look like your training data by design and that's not what we want. And so the ideal way would be if you have a large test data set you can try imputing but usually we get a few samples for prediction and in that case I think using a method that can deal with surrogates or missing uh, um, features would be the best approach. I know only random forests that can do that. Mm -hmm. I think for some of the others you can calculate 
very cool importance, but I don't know some method that other methods that would use uh, surrogates automatically on maybe yeah. David most others. Yeah. So today, Dr. Fenio provided a brief idea about different biomarker selection methods and how it could help in optimal selection of features. We also learned that cross validation, forward selection and backward selection plays an important role in feature selection. LAS is a very good software to explore these kind of extraction features. We should choose features keeping in mind two important things. Model should be as simple as possible so that we could interpret easily. At the same time, the model should also provide a good prediction. Today we also learned curse of dimensionality. In simple words, the complex algorithm and data frame having a big number of dimensions or features frequently make the target function very complex and it may lead to the model overfitting. Finally, Dr. Finney talked about sampling biasness and biomarker discovery. He also mentioned about data snooping. It refers to the statistical inference that the researcher decides to perform after looking at the data. We should avoid sampling biasness and construct pre-planned interferences. For example, a group of researchers plan to compare three dosages of a drug in a clinical trial. They pre-plan the data comparison on the basis of record of patients and group the patients on the basis of that which is an example of data snooping. The next lecture will be hands on session on WebGStart by Dr. Bing Jiang. Thank you.